quick check, the um, usual check to make sure that everybody is in the right room. Um, I'm for the next um, hour and a half-ish, I'm going to be talking about Hadoop, taking you right from knowing nothing about Hadoop to um, getting up and running and, and having a quick look at it. Um, I always say that at the start, that's for, so those people who have suddenly realized they're in the wrong room, that gives you uh, five minutes to, to get out and find the room that you're supposed to be in. Oh, everybody's still here. Okay, so that's good. All right, so we'll start with a quick introduction. This is me, my name's Gary Short. I'm the head of data science for Black Marble. Black Marble are a Microsoft Gold partner based in the Midlands. Um, if you want to get a hold of me after the session, um, you can get a hold of me. My email address is there. It's gary at blackmarble.co.uk. Or you can find me on Facebook or on Twitter at Gary Short. Okay, who's on Twitter here? A few people, most people, excellent. Right, feel free to um, ask me a question on Twitter. That's fine, I far prefer questions on Twitter. As I've said, pretty much at the start of every session, um, it's my preferred way of taking questions, mainly because your question can only be 140 characters long if you ask it on Twitter, all right? As opposed, if you send me an email, it can be pages and pages long, all right? So, that's me. What are we going to do for the next, um, I say hour and hour and a half, uh, this session is not going to overrun. This session is not going to overrun for two reasons. Firstly, it's the session before lunch. And if I overrun, then everybody else at the conference eats your lunch. All right? And then I get really bad feedback. Okay? And the other reason that the session is not going to overrun is because mostly at conferences, the sessions are an hour. At Software Architect, they are 90 minutes. I forget that every single year until I turn up and see the schedule and I go, ah, oh, I've done it again. All right? So this session will run somewhere between an hour and an hour and a half. Okay? Um, it definitely will not overrun for those two reasons. Um, so what we're going to cover is we're going to define the problem that Hadoop fixes for us. All right, if um, Hadoop has come along, it's come into the marketplace, it's got a lot of traction, it's um, you know, really high up there on the hype curve just now. For that to have happened, there must be an actual problem that it solves. Um, so we're going to have a look and see what that problem is and we'll define it. We'll define the solution to that problem, um, <laughs> obviously. Uh, and then we'll um, uncover what normally happens is you have a problem, then you come up with a solution, and you discover that all you've really done is swap one set of problems for another set of problems. You haven't really got a solution, all right? So we'll look at some of the problems with the obvious solution. Um, and then we'll have a look at Hadoop. And that really, that, that, those first three parts of the agenda, they really just set the context for Hadoop. Shows you the problem, shows you a solution, shows really the kind of problems that you're going to have with that solution, and then um, once we've got that context, we'll show how Hadoop actually fits in there and actually solves all of those problems for us. There are many flavors of Hadoop, um, mainly because it's an infrastructure, it's not really a product on its own. Um, and so we'll be having um, a look at different companies who have come up with, who slice and dice Hadoop slightly differently for, di for different purposes. We'll have a look at those. Um, we'll have a look at the full Hadoop environment. Probably, I can't think of anybody actually off the top of my head who has installed everything, okay? I would probably suggest, bearing in mind the good old architecture paradigm of single responsibility, that if you have built an Hadoop cluster and you're using everything in the environment, then you're probably doing something wrong. You should probably break that down into a number of smaller clusters doing particular jobs, um, in which case you then we need everything in the environment. But we'll run through the entirety of the environment just so you know what's out there and you can say, well, actually, for my purposes, I need this bit and this bit and this bit, all right? You probably should never, if you have found yourself installing the entire environment onto your cluster, you should probably sit down and go, mm, I might be doing something a bit wrong here. So look at that. We'll have a look at installing it. And when I say we'll have a look at, we won't, that's a lie, I'll tell you. Um, the reason for that is that uh, it pretty much requires a very beefy um, internet connection to install Hadoop, um, even if you're doing it like in single mode on a, on a particular laptop. You may well have noticed, those of you with connected devices, that we are lacking in a beefy internet connection. And so what I'll do is I will step you through the, the process. Um, it, it's not hugely, it's not hugely um, complicated. I'm sure smart people like you don't actually need me to show you pressing a button when I say press the button marked install. Um, I'm sure we're all grown-ups. So we'll talk a bit about that. Fortunately, I won't 
actually demonstrate it. And then at, at the end, um, we'll make Hadoop do stuff, right? Just basically because you've suffered through all of the slides, we'll actually make it do something, which is, which is kind of good. And unfortunately, um, this slide, I, I, I say unfortunately, that's wrong. I, I'm not going to make any apologies for it because this session is entitled Zero to Hadoop. And I want to give you an overview of the entire infrastructure and everything that's out there. Um, so it is quite slide intensive. It's, and each of the slides has quite a lot of information on it. And that's for two reasons. One, to torture you, because I like to torture audiences. And secondly, because you can go back afterwards and download the slides from the, from the website and actually have it as a, as a reference manual. And then you can, you can um, pursue bits of it that, that interests you. But just so that you don't feel like totally slashing your wrists by the end of the session, we will do some um, code and we'll, we'll have a look. OK, so that's basically me. That's basically what I'm going to be talking about. Before we do that, let's have a, a little chat about yourselves. Anybody here actually actively using Hadoop right now? No. Anybody here knows what Hadoop is and has had a look at it already? OK, kind of. So there's a few people out there who go, so you, you kind of know what Hadoop is enough to want to come along to a session to find out about Hadoop. Right, so that's kind of where everybody is. Excellent, so we've kind of pitched this just right. There was nothing worse than having a Hadoop expert in the session, in the session, going, I am so bored. Right? I'll tell you now, if you are an Hadoop expert, you will be bored. Tomorrow is the session for you. Anybody planning to hang around tomorrow for the post conferences? All right. So tomorrow, I'm doing much more hands-on, actually doing stuff, and um, with Hadoop, and we'll we'll basically spend a day um, doing that kind of thing tomorrow. Um, today is more of the, this is what we're doing. So that's the infrastructure. What about languages? Who here is actually Pro, I know it's a software architects conference, but who here pro actually programs? Who writes code? Excellent, most people. So when I show you code, you're not going to be scared, which is always good. Um, you go to some architects conferences and they say, well, we want Hadoop because it is an architecture issue, which it is, right? But you can't really make Hadoop do anything without showing code. And sometimes you show code and people go, oh, but the last time I coded, it was in COBOL, and that's not COBOL. Um, I can tell you now there is no um, language library to allow you to write COBOL for Hadoop, right? Um, bit of an oversight, there you go. So what, what is the split here? Who, who does Java? All right, most people, excellent. Who does C Sharp? All right, same amount of people. Who does Java and C Sharp? That explains it. Okay, there we go. So there's a good mixture of languages, excellent. And um, we'll have a look at both of those. Um, we'll have a look at both of those languages. I say we'll have a look at both of those languages. I am not a Java developer to trade. Um, when I say I'm not a Java developer, you can, when we have a look at the code, you'll see you don't, actually have to, you don't actually have to write much Java to get something going. There's a lot of boilerplate code which can be put in, in a template, and then you, f you fill in the parts. All right? I have filled in the parts. If my Java is terrible, you Java people, please feel free to tell me. I may or may not take your criticism on board. Um, but it's always good to know that, that my Java sucks. Um, but my C-sharp should be okay. Um, so we've done that. We've done languages. SQL, who knows um, SQL here? Excellent, so most people, good. We might have a look at, a, we'll see how time goes and stuff like that. We might have a look at a sort of SQL um, interface into um, Hadoop as well. Because um, there's lots of, there are lots of ways to get into Hadoop. Um, basically because there are lots of people who want to get into Hadoop and those people have different skill sets. And the community have been very good at responding to that and saying, well, if you're a Java programmer, um, just to let you know, Hadoop is written in Java. And so if you want to write native code for Hadoop, it is going to be in Java. But there are lots of other language supports, including um, SQL, for those of you from a, from a SQL background. So most of us know Java, most of us know C Sharp, most of us know SQL. Excellent. Anybody here had a look at Pig, Pig Latin? No, nope, nobody. Okay, so that'll be something new. We may take a little bit of a look at that. It's um, it's a domain-specific language for Hadoop, where somebody has gone. No, no, I know there are languages out there, but what the what the world needs right now is another programming language, <laughs> and this one is particularly. Um, it's it's a it's a DSL, as I say, for Hadoop. It's called Pig Latin. Um, I mean, I mean, you laugh, but you know, SQL is a DSL for databases, and it's very good. And let's face it. Who would rather write C Sharp or Java to interface with a database than write SQL? SQL is very good at it, and Pig Latin is the same. Um, Pig is very good for for what it's for what it's actually designed for. So we won't laugh at them too much. But you know, it was the guy who suddenly thought, no, 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 you can you can use you can use all of these languages to interface with the Duke, but I think I'll write another one. Uh, okay, so that's fine. So I've got a good sense there of what everybody 
is up to. So let's have a look at the problem that MapReduce <coughs> solves uh, for, for a kickoff. Um, so let's jump into Visual Studio. So for some reason, we, we all know that um, you can't introduce a new programming language or a new topic without doing a Hello World application. Um, it's just the law. Um, if you don't sacrifice a Hello World application to the demo gods, then they will smite you and your, none of your demos will work for the rest of your session, if not the rest of your day. It's not any different for Hadoop, but for some reason, someone somewhere has decided that the Hello World application of Hadoop is actually a word count. Um, and so every time you see an Hadoop presentation, they will probably start with a word count. Every time you, you have a look at MapReduce, they will start with a word count application. It's just the hello world of, of MapReduce. Um, and so what we're going to do here is we're going to do a, a, a word count. And this is, this is how you might do it if you were just asked to write a piece of code. So what I've done here is this is just representing my input here. It's just a string, and you can see what I've cleverly done there. There's one word one, there's two word twos, three word threes, four word fours. Okay, so we're going to do a word count. And if the word count works, then you know we should see one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four. So this is this might be how you um, do it if you were asked to do this. You take the input, split it up, you can group by the actual words, and then iterate over the words, and you can return the word and the actual count of the number of times that word appears. All right, so it's a fairly simple word count and we'll just launch that and make sure I can in fact program and I can program but I can't work Visual Studio. If you press the right buttons, it will go. Oh no, what's wrong with my Visual Studio? Go. There we go. Don't know what happened there. Right, so can you guys see that at the back? It's not a particularly big room. Code's big enough. Excellent. So that works. Okay, one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four. Excellent. So there's obviously two issues with that problem, uh, two issues with this solution. Um, going forward, running it at scale. Okay, so what are the two problems that you're going to have? Anybody? Okay, so that's the less obvious one. Um, that's very good. Actually, usually people get the obvious one first. So the issue we've got here is we're going to be constrained by um, processor. So as our input gets bigger and bigger, we'll be constrained by our processing power. We will be able to get to the end of um, doing the calculation, but we might not be able to do it in a time scale that is acceptable. Um, you can imagine what we're doing here is we're taking an input and we're actually counting numbers, but you can imagine if we were taking a large input and we were calculating a probability graph um, or something like that. All right, if we're doing some kind of Bayesian influence or if we're doing computational linguistics or some of the other things that data scientists will do, they are computationally intensive and as the input grows, at, at the point we're going to get to some point in the future where it takes so long to calculate the answer. Um, it's, it's a bit like I worked at the bank once when um, we had an issue where our overnight process took 16 hours to run. All right, that's not an overnight process. Okay, so you get that kind of you, you get that kind of um, issues. So we're CPU bound. All right, and obviously, being CPU bound, what is the more obvious one? Memory. Sorry, memory. memory. Exactly, we're we're memory we're memory bound as well. Okay, we're going to get to a point where so normally the answers come back as we're memory bound. We're going to get to a point here because what we're doing is we're reading that entire content in in one gulp and we're processing it. We're going to get um, to the point where the, the input grows to such an extent that um, we can't pull it all in in, in in one go. So we're constrained by RAM. And then what we do is we would process that by a stream. We just take it one part at a time, which solves the memory problem, but then leads to the problem that you say you do that and that's fine, but then we're then constrained by CPU um, because it then takes so long. So the solution to that problem is a pattern called MapReduce. So let's just have a quick look at that. Um, let's make this the startup project and uh, open that one up. Okay, is everybody familiar with the MapReduce? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Can you change your screen? You can change, yes. Is it too, too dark to see? <laughs> I was sort of turn the lights out, but you guys would all fall asleep. I'll turn, it to, I'll turn it on to a light theme so you can see it. Uh, ba, ba, ba. I say that. Um, not sure I can remember how to do that. There we go.
<laughs> Don't you just love Visual Studio? Isn't that fantastic? All right. OK, so the answer to that question is no. Um, we can't. Um, let, me, let me just put that back, because that's even worse now. Let me try. Let me try wrecking the microphone. All right. So, top tip: if you stand on the microphone lead, when you stand up, everything breaks. I hope they've still got sound. What I could do now is just stand there. Like, and the guy who's editing the video go, "Oh my God, it's broken." All right. So let's turn off the lights. Let's see if that's any better. And we're all going to fall asleep. Yeah, that's that's not good. All right, how's that? Excellent. So that's kind of a good. I'm not. I'm not too sure how the camera will work in the dark. That's the only thing. We'll we'll be coming out of, of um, Visual Studio just in a minute. Um, so, has everybody heard of the MapReduce pattern before? Or would you do you need me to explain it? Okay. So see, there was an or in there, right? <laughs> Therefore, you must answer one of them. All right. So who knows what the MapReduce pattern is? OK, most people. Who has never heard of it before in their life? OK, so what the MapReduce pattern does is, and I'll demonstrate it here, it takes, there's two parts to it. There is the map function and the reduce function. So here, um, what we have is our map function. And if you imagine, um, the easiest way to explain MapReduce to somebody who's never seen it before, this is not entirely correct, all right? But the easiest way to think about it for people who have never come across it before is if you think of MapReduce as being like SQL, then the map is the select statement and the reduce is the group statement. Okay? So in the map statement, what we're going to do is we're going to take an input, okay, and we're going to break it up into a key value pair. All right? So we'll get a key um, and then we'll get whatever values we want to attach to that. And we will return a tuple of those things. Okay, from the map function. Now, in this case, what we're doing is we're doing a word count. So our map function is very straightforward. What it's going to do is um, we're, going to get a, we're going to get the string in. And what we're going to do is we're going to split that string up. We're going to iterate over the string. And we're going to create a tuple where the key is going to be the word. Okay, and the value we're going to attach to that word is going to be the integer 1 i.e. we've seen this word one time. All right? So basically what the map function is doing, there's a whole stream of words coming towards it and it's going, that's a word, that's one word, that's one word, that's one word. Okay? So that's what the map function does. It selects things with a key and then it attaches a value to it. What happens in the reduce function down here okay, is we take all of the all of the tuples with the same key, okay, will get sent to the same reducer, all right? So what's going to happen now is at this reducer, it's going to get all the ands, for example. So what's going to happen is it's going to get a, an input, which basically has the key of and plus all of the values that came from all of the mappers, all right? So if we had 10 mappers all going, that's a word, that's a word, that's a word. Every time it came to an and, the mapper would go, that's an and, I've seen and one time, and throw it away. The reducer who was dealing with ands would get a tuple where it was keyed on the word and, and it would get one, 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 all of the ones from all of the mappers. Okay? And what we want to do is group that all together. Okay? So what our reducer is going to do is it's going to iterate over that. It's going to create a new tuple where the key is going to be the same key that the mapper gave it. Okay, so it's going to be the word and, for example. And then what it's going to do is it's going to sum up all of the ones. And so what we're going to do is, in essence, we're going to get a count for all of that, for all of those words. Okay, so let's just run that. And if I can program this properly, we'll have the same result. There we do. Okay, so we've got one, one, two, two. All right, so that's what we've done there is we've split the algorithm that we had, which wasn't really paralyzable, okay, the way we had it, and we split it into a map function and a reduce function. And that is paralyzable now, okay, very simply because we've got one map function and one reduce function, all right, but more importantly, we can have as many map functions as we require, okay. We can have 
as many reduce functions as we require. Okay, and we just we can just scale out as we need more mappers, we just scale out more nodes. As we need more reducers, we can scale out more, more nodes. All right? So it's parallelizable now there practically infinitely. All right? The map reduce pattern is key to Hadoop. Okay? So it's important that we understand it from this point forward. Does everybody understand what map reduce does? Okay, it's like select and group. Yep. Anybody, any questions before we go on with that? I shall show you, right? So this is the solution. And you know why I said I was going to talk about some problems with this solution? So that is a problem. So it's a, it's a brilliant question, right? And a lot of people don't actually see that. Say, well, that just works wonderfully. But how does the output from here get to be the input over here? Okay. And more importantly, how does it get all sorted so that all of the output from a mapper that is the same key ends up at the same reducer? Because if all of the output from the mappers just goes to any random reducer, you've not saved yourself anything, right? And the reducer can't work because it's working on a group function. And if this reducer doesn't have all of the word and, for example, if there's four reducers that's got that, what you're going to end up then was four groups, and you're still not going to know the, t the title. So that is very important. How does it get from the mapper to the reducer? And how do we make sure that it gets grouped properly so that all of the groupings go to the one reducer? We will cover that in the future, but that's an excellent question. Anybody else? Um, in your mapper code? Yes. Can you show the code? Yes. Uh, did you have a for each again? I think you have, you have the same problem. Um, yes. Yeah. But, so we're going to cover that as well. So, so you say, didn't, don't I have the same problem? Because I've got a for each, and then don't I have the same problem? No, because I said I can have as many mappers as I want. Right. All right? OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to partition the data, right? And we're going to get onto that as well, all right? Okay. So what you do is you want, that's, it's pretty much how you know you need another mapper, right? My mapper is taking an hour to run. That's fine. My mapper is taking a day to run. Well, guess what? We need more mappers, right? So, um, that, so that's another good point that falls on to exactly what that gentleman was saying, and we're going to cover that as well. Anybody else? These are, see, this is why I like common software architects. You get sensible questions. Yes. Sir. You mentioned it, uh, you mined uh, more than one mapper. Is it yes. a copy of the same code running on different nodes, or is it totally different implementation of mapper? It's the exact same code running on every mapper. Right. All right. So it means otherwise it would be a maintenance nightmare, right? If you have a thousand node cluster and eight hundred of those nodes are mappers, because you always require more mappers than reducers. If it wasn't the same code, you would have potentially 800 different copies. And if one of them failed, uh, it would be a nightmare. So it is, it's, it is the exact same copy of the code that gets um, expressed across each of the mappers. And we'll talk about how that gets done as well. OK? All right, any more for any more? No? All right, so let's get back to our slides. Which seem to have vanished. Is this in here? Excellent. So. <clears throat> It's a good job I'm a trained professional. Mm -hmm. right. That's going to happen every single time, clearly. So what I'm going to do is put this in my pocket. It will be hilarious, wouldn't it? You would think this would be a solved problem as well, wouldn't you? Wired microphones, I don't know. It's a hard, it's exactly, see, it's a hardware problem. <laughs> okay, so as this gentleman said here, one of the problems you're going to get is, well, there was a for each in your mapper. So there we have a solution. We started off with a problem that said input is getting bigger. Okay, we are, we're in a situation now where for some industries, it's actually cheaper to hold on to information than it is to destroy it. All right, I'm just going to leave you for a second with that while that follows through. The reason that is, is because every year the cost of storage gets less and less. All right? I mean, it's something ridiculous now, like it's something like 10 cents a gigabyte or something like that for, for storage. It's, it's ridiculously cheap. Whereas, especially if you work in a regulated industry, if you want to destroy information, right, if you want to throw out information, and so for a start, if you can identify a living human being from the information that you're destroying, you fall under the, the, 
the remit of the Data Protection Act, and so you must destroy your data in accordance with with whatever makes them happy. And there's going to be a cost attached to that. If you're in a regulated industry like banking or insurance or utilities companies, forensics, medical, all that kind of stuff, there will be other um, other restrictions put on the way that you can actually get rid of data. And there'll be a cost attached to those as well. So on the one hand, with all the regulation, the cost of disposing data is going up at the same time as the cost of just keeping it is going down. So there's a lot of companies now that go, do you know what, we're not, going to, we're not going to purge our database every five years or whatever, as you know used to happen years ago. You know, We're just going to go, do you know what, we're just going to hang on to all of it because it's cheaper that way. All right? But what that means is you, you then have issues like this. The information that you're trying to process gets bigger and bigger. And at some point, we're going to get to a point where we can't process it um, without parallelizing um, our code. So we looked at how we can parallelize it using MapReduce, but as this gentleman rightly pointed out, well, you had a for each where you were iterating across there inside your mapper, so you have that same problem, right? And we're not going to have that problem because what we have to do is we have to partition our mapper, we have to partition our data so our mapper is consuming a manageable um, amount of data. Well, we're responsible for that. So we've fixed one problem. Hey, we've made that we've made that large input problem go away, but now we're just inheriting a lot more problem because now we've got to, we've got this partitioning problem. So we have to get our data to the right, whatever that means for your particular organization, to the right size for your mapper. So that's an issue that we have to deal with. It's a problem that that we have now. There's the distance that it travels. Okay, um, we have a mapper which is code. It runs on some data, right? Um, ideally, you want the code and the data to be on the same machine, right? So you have two problems there. Either the code and the data is on the same node, in which case you're responsible for partitioning that data and making sure that data is on that node with that code, or your code and your data are separate, in which case you have distance problems. You know, if you're trying to move large amounts of data from one rack across your data center to another rack, that's going to take time. All right, so you have an, an issue there, and you may have, you have to solve that problem. So the sort of data traveling, data distance issue is now another problem that we have to solve. All right? and we're actually getting further. If you notice as well, we're getting further and further away from the problem that we're actually trying to solve. So the problem that we started off trying to solve is the business might have said to us, Gary, it's really important that we can word count the number of words in this document. Right? I want you to solve that problem. That's the problem we're trying to do. We're trying to create a nice Excel graph with, a, with you know, the, the word count. Right? And now we're talking, about, we're talking about data centers and code over here and data over here, and we have to solve all these problems. And we're now way, way, way away from the actual problem we're trying to solve. But that's something else that we need to think about. What about hard drive failures? Okay. If you've partitioned this data, yay! Okay, so I've partitioned it, and my mapper's running, and that hard drive on that node fails, and that mapper stops, and that data is lost, and all the other mappers work, and everything is working as far as we can say. We get an answer out the bottom, right? It says, hey, it's, here's the word count, but unbeknown to you, one of your nodes has died, right? And that mapper software has stopped running and the data's gone, okay? But you won't notice that because you just get a number at the bottom. The number looks, it looks realistic enough. It looks reasonable. Yeah, we'll just go with that. So there has to be a monitoring of, you know, is all of the nodes working properly? Have you lost any data? You know, have the hard drives gone? What are you going to do if you do lose a hard drive? Are you going to rerun the entire job? Um, what's going to happen? That's, that's a problem that you're going to have. And it's very realistic. Okay, somebody once asked me in one of these sessions, well, pff, you know, I've got a laptop. It's five years old. I've never had a hard drive failure. How likely is it that we'll have a hard drive failure? It's like, well, as I said to him, let's do the maths. So let's imagine we've got a, a mean time between failures of three years. It's about three years is about the industry standard for hard drives, um, certainly on, on laptops. So therefore, right, the probability of having a hard drive failure is one over three times 365. So it's one out of three years, basically, which is around about one in a thousand, okay? Which means every time you hit the power button on your laptop or on your PC or whatever, there's a one in 1,000 chance that the hard drive will fail. I can live with that, right? That's, that sounds pretty reasonable to me. I'll, I'll take those odds. However, 
if you've got a 100 node cluster and each of those servers have 12 disks, right? Now the probability becomes 100 times 12 over 3 times 365, which is 1200 over 1095, which is greater than 1. And if you remember your probability lessons from school, anything that's 1 or greater is a certainty, all right? Which means if you've got a 100 node cluster, each with 12 disks, right? On any given day, you're pretty much guaranteed to have a hard drive failure. Right, on any given day. If you work, have you ever been to a large, anybody here ever been to a large data center? Okay, there are interns and students and, and young newly qualified people whose job it is to run around with a cart of hard drives, right, and just change hard drives, right? Because you have many, many, many hard drive failures. There are many thousands of hard drives in a data center, okay? <laughs> it's exactly, it's exactly the same. Yeah, isn't, yes, exactly. Science has driven forward. So instead of running around with valves, they run around with hard drives, but they're doing this exactly the same job. All right, it's, so it's the, it's the same thing. So absolutely, not only is it, not only is it realistic to have to expect hard drive failures, you know, you can pretty much guarantee on a daily basis, given a large enough cluster, okay, you will have hard drive failures. That is another problem that you have to solve, okay? So what we actually want is a framework that will handle all of that stuff for us, right? So that we can get back to actually solving the problem that we started to try and solve in the first place, all right? So what we actually want is for us to be able to concentrate on writing the code to solve the problem, to find the business piece of BI or whatever it is that the business actually wants, the calculation at CERN, the graph that your manager <coughs> needs for his monthly meetings or whatever, and the framework will handle everything else for us, all right? And that's what Hadoop will do, okay? And it actually came about for that very reason. The guy who invented Hadoop um, was working on, and I, n I never actually find out why, right? It doesn't seem very sensible to me, but I'm sure he had, he's a very bright chap, so I'm sure he had very good reasons for doing it. But he woke up one morning and he said, I'm going to create an open source network index crawler Google. I'm basically going to have the open source version of Google and it'll be available to anybody, right? I have no idea why he decided that was going to be a good idea. But much like Google, he very quickly found out that that is a hard problem to solve, all right? Indexing the internet, right, is a hard problem to solve. And he ran into all of these problems, right? He had to partition his data, he would lose hard drives, he had to, he spent more time actually babysitting the system than actually getting any usable information out of the system. And he was on the point of giving up when he read a paper from Google, um, two papers from Google. One was on the MapReduce and the other was on, you know, the infrastructure that MapReduce would run on. And he said to himself, do you know what? That's the answer to that problem. I will implement the, um, I will implement the contents of that paper in code and then I will run my open source um, indexer on that um, platform. Uh, time passed, nobody was interested in his open source um, internet indexer, but lots of people were interested in this, which um, that framework which came to be known as a dupe. The reason it came to be known as a dupe was because the chap has several rules for naming open source projects. Um, rule one, it must be one word. Okay. Rule two, the word must be absolutely unique, so when people search for your open source project on Google, only the stuff with open source pro to do with your open source project will come up, okay? And his son, I believe at the time, had a small, cuddly elephant. Small, yellow elephant, cuddly toy, right? Which the son had named Hadoop, right? I'm not sure whether the son had actually named that or whether he had just hiccuped at the time, and from then on the elephant was known as Hadoop, right? I'm not sure, but the elephant was known as Hadoop, and the guy who wrote the framework said that's a brilliant name for an open source project because it's, my son's just made that name up, so it's, you know, there's no way anybody else has got it, all right? And so Hadoop is called Hadoop, and that's, so that's why it's called Hadoop, and it's also why the icon for Hadoop is a small yellow elephant, right? It's not because elephants never forget, and, you know, it's not, nothing to do with that. It's because Hadoop really is a small yellow elephant, right? It's as simple as that. Unfortunately, because software engineers in particular have little or no imagination, um, every project that's come into the Hadoop infrastructure, okay, has 
carried on the animal theme, okay? Which is why the language is called pig, all right? And all the rest of it, there's hive and there's zookeeper and there's all of these kind of things, all right? It's because we have no imagination. It's the same as why, it's the same reasons we have Java and we have jars and we all have that nonsense because you put the Java in the jar, isn't that clever? No, not really. Um, <laughs> nice to know that things have not changed <laughs> since, since then at all. So, Hadoop um, actually came about because this chap who was working on this open source indexing problem had exactly the same problems as we'd just been talking about. And this is what he did to solve it. And now this framework will solve these problems for us. Implementing and working on this framework will allow us to concentrate on actually solving the business problem, which let's face it, that's what we get paid for, right? Our employers pay us to solve business problems because we have built up subject matter ex expertise in the business, all right? If it was just general problems they wanted us to solve, they'd hire general people, all right? And so we are far more productive when we are solving problems that only a small group of people know how to solve, okay? A small group of people with that subject matter expertise. And Hadoop allows us to do that. Hadoop allows us to forget about the general and concentrate on the specific, which is what we are employed to do. And this is how it works. This is an awesome graphic. Um, so this is how uh, Hadoop works. Um, we'll start off down here. So Hadoop can handle structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data. Okay? Does everybody know what those three terms mean? Does anybody need me to explain those three terms? What's that? Okay. Is that like schemas, semi-schemas, and unschemas, or how do you relate? <laughs> you just change a word and go, is that the same thing? Um, kind of, but not quite. So. Structured data is the easiest one. It's, it's the one we know. It's your SQL database with a schema that says this table, every single row, will have these columns. Okay? The information in the column may be a null if we've allowed that, but the column will exist. Okay? Semi-structured data is a bit, a good example of semi-structured data is a tweet. If you go on to um, the Twitter website and look up the API, they will define what a tweet is looks like, and it says, you will get one or more of the following fields when you search for a tweet. You are not guaranteed to get all of them because, for example, some of them are preferences. So, for example, when you make a tweet, you may select, you may um, select the option that allows you to put your location with your tweet, all right? In that case, if you were to do that, if I were to search for your tweet, I would have location information in there, all right? If you decided you didn't want the world to know, and especially the NSA, to know where you were, okay, you would turn that off. And if I search for your tweet, that information would be missing. So semi-structured information says the schema in general looks like this, but you're going to get some subset of that. Okay? So that's semi-structured. And unstructured data is data which has no structure whatsoever. So if you can imagine, for example, if I had a database of your feedback forms, all right? If the feedback form says, please rate the following between one and five, where five is awesome and one really sucks, okay? That is structured data, all right? At the bottom, um, I might say, please make any comments that you want to, and you're just going to write freehand whatever, right? Gary's presentation was all right, but he kind of lost it in the middle when he was talking about semi-structured data, all right? That has no structure whatsoever. It's just your written notes, all right? So that's unstructured data, all right? And Hadoop can handle all of those things, okay? Which is kind of handy. So what happens is <coughs> that data comes in, gets into what's called a name node. So Hadoop is broken down into two parts, really. There is a name node, and then there is one or more um, data nodes, all right? And the name node knows where all the IP address, you can. Feel free to take photographs if you want, but the slides are actually available on the website. You can download the entire slide deck afterwards. It might be, might be easier just to do that. Um, and so there is a name node um, which basically manages everything. It knows um, or it gets told um, what is the mapping code, what is the reducing code, um, and what data it has to process. Okay? It also knows a bunch of IP addresses of a bunch of um, data nodes. All right. And so when the name node here, you will log on either command line, if you're old school, or through a web UI. Um, you will upload data to the name node. 
Okay. Then you will upload code. Here's my mapper. Here's my reducer. Okay. And then you will hit a button that says go, pretty much. And what will happen is the name node here, it will break down. First thing it's going to do is it's going to break down the data. By default, it will break down the data into 64 megabyte slices. All right. So this gets around your problem of, well, you've got a for each in there that you're iterating over. All right. So by default, it will be 64 meg. All right. That is configurable. Um, if, if you want it to be something else, it can be something else. All right. But by default, it's 64 megs. And then what happens is all of that data is sent out to the data nodes. And it's stored once and replicated twice. Okay? So it's stored on a data node. It's then stored on another node in that same rack. So now we have node redundancy. So this gets around the problem of what happens if we've got a hard drive failure. Okay? So what happens if you've got a hard drive failure is nothing, pretty much. That node dies. All right? But the, second, the other node in that rack carries on processing that 64 megabytes of data. Okay, so that's the first time it's replicated. The second time it's replicated, it's replicated onto a node in a different rack. Okay, so now we have rack redundancy. So we can, we can actually lose an entire rack of nodes and still the job will finish. All right, so stored once, replicated twice. If um, one of those replications, because as far as, uh, as, far as Hadoop's concerned, they are, they are all equal, Okay, if one of them dies, then the name node will be informed that one of them has died. It will mark that data as being under-replicated, and it will replicate it a further n number of times depending on what's lost. Obviously, if it's lost a rack, then it's actually lost two nodes with that data on it, so it will replicate it two more times. If, it's, if it only loses a, a node, then it's just lost one of those, so it will only replicate it one more time. All right, so it depends what kind of failure it has. But Hadoop will always maintain three copies. Okay? Then what Hadoop is going to do is it's going to send out, and somebody was asking, is it the same code? The next thing that Hadoop is going to do is it's going to send the mapping code to all of the mappers. All right? And then the job is going to run. That mapping functionality is going to run, and we're going to get a whole load. These mappers, all of, let's just say they're all mappers for the sake of... Um, for the sake of argument at the minute. All of these things are mappers. So they're all going to have a whole load of words there. Still, we're doing word count. So they'll have a whole load of words there, a whole load of words there, a whole load of words, a whole load of words, a whole, 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 whole load of words there. All right? So at this point, two things are going to happen. The next thing that's going to happen is a combiner is going to run on the actual node. Right? So what that's going to say is, if I've got the word and, and I might have the word and, the, and in, okay, that's fine. If I've got the word and, the, in and and again, right? I'm going to combine those two things. I'm not going to, I don't need the reducer to tell me, okay, I don't need to pass that on to reducer for grouping. I know as a mapper, right, I was supposed to map this. I've mapped this and I've got the same thing. So I, I, I must be okay to be able to combine those because that's what I was asked to do. So the combiner will combine um, like keys on the mapper, okay? Then what's going to happen is a brilliant thing which is just commonly known as the Hadoop shuffle. Okay, what happens in the Hadoop shuffle is that um, the Hadoop will take all of the words from all of the mappers, right? And it'll say, right, all of the ands, I'm going to group those and sort them, and all of the ands are going to go to that reducer, and all of the this are going to go to that reducer, and all of the becauses are going to go to that reducer. Okay, so it's going to make sure that reduced, sorry, mapped output with the same key will go to the same reducer, all right? Now that is one of these facts that everybody goes, right, and kind of puts it to the back of their mind, but it's one of the fundamental things that you need to know about a map reducer or a Hadoop cluster is that like keys go to the same reducer, all right? So can anybody see an issue that might give you? So not only massive, right, but it could be universal. What if every, what if all of the output from your mappings has a universal key? What that means is you're absolutely right, okay? You can have 100 nodes all doing reductions, right? If there's one key, it all goes to the one reducer, right? Now you say, what kind of an idiot would write code like that? And when you're writing um, the Java code that we'll look at later on, right, you'd be absolutely right. You would be dumb to do that, okay? But it's very easy to do that when you're looking at one of the other interfaces, like Hive, for example, which has a SQL abstraction over Hadoop. 
right? It's very easy to go group by star. Well, hey, especially if you're just kind of, especially if you're just kind of, you know, prototyping something out, and it's very easy to leave that in and then hit the button, and you basically kill your Hadoop cluster, right? And if I'm running Hadoop cluster and you kill my cluster, right, you are not my favorite person, all right? Because that will spoil my whole day, all right? Because you basically end up with 99, 99 reducers all standing going, and one of them just churning its little guts out, all right? Okay, but that's what happens. So all of the output from the map gets grouped, it gets sorted, and sent to the reducer. The reducer then does um, the final grouping, okay, just like I showed in the code. It basically iterates over that and sums all of those things, or in some other way, provides an aggregation of your answer and outputs that. And so if you've got 99 reducers, sorry, if you've got 100 reducers, you're going to end up with 100 part files, okay, because each reducer will output its file, all right? And then you just come along at the end and you cat all of those together, and that is your output. Okay, so it's quite complicated, but actually once you know what happens, it's, it's very straightforward. The input comes in, it's broken down into 64 megabyte chunks. Those 64 megabyte chunks are then sent out to the nodes, they are stored once, they're replicated twice. The mapping function is sent out to the mappers and the reducing function is sent out to the reducers. On the mappers, the mappers do their mapping work, whatever that is, the, the, the basic select, then on each mapper, there is, there is an optional combine stage, okay, where like keys on the mapper are combined together. Then, yes, sir? So in that part, how does it know how to combine them together? Like, because you specify. A combine function? Exactly. Oh. And I'll show you how to do that as well, right? And in this case, is that exactly the same as the reducer? Ex yes. So in some cases, your combiner is exactly the same as the reducer, right? In which case, when, when you're setting up the job, you can actually say, my mapper is this, my reducer is this, my combiner is my reducer, okay, so all right? Like a pre-reduce step, like a reduce before. Yes, absolutely, because there's no it's point. A single node it, exactly, it's a single node reduce because there's no point in sending that information to a reducer because you can do it now. You have that code right there, you have the code, you have the data, you know what you have to do. There's no point in moving all that potentially to another rack in your data because you know what is required to be done. So just do it, okay? If you don't want them to do that, I mean, it's optional, all right? If, if you actually want everything to go to the reducer, then don't specify a combiner, right? And it won't do that, all right? So on the mapper, the mapper does its work. There is an optional combine step on the mapper, all right? Then it goes to the reducer. The reducer does the reduction and the aggregation and does the output, and then you come along and cut it all at the end, okay? Pretty straightforward, yes. Uh, sorry, say that again? Different developers, yes. No, different uh, forms of the same word. Different forms of the same word. Okay, so it very much, so the question there is, what about different forms of the same word, all right? And that very much depends on the, the intelligence behind your mapper. It very much depends on what you want to achieve, okay? So you can do one of two things. One is, different forms of the same word, you can say, well, they are different words. They're spelled differently, therefore, they are different words. Somebody might type in, you might be building an inverted index, for example, okay? And so somebody might type in each of the different forms and you want them to only find the form that they've typed. In which case, that's easy because you just treat it like a simple, like a, like a different word. You may want um, different forms of the same word or actually words with the same stem to actually be treated the same. And then in that case, what you do with your mapper is you would take in the word, you would run a stemmer, on it, right, to find the stem of the word, right, and then count the stem, not the actual word itself, okay? And then what you'd end up with, if you were building an inverted index, you would build, you would end up with an inverted index of the stems. And then when somebody searched for a word, you would take that word, and then you would take the, the stem of that word, and then you would return everything with that stem, okay? So it very much depends on what it is that you're trying to achieve, um, but that's all coded inside your mapping function. So basically, your mapping function can do anything that you can imagine, right? If you can imagine something and you can code it in Java or you can code it in C Sharp, then you can do it, okay? By extension, you could send it to a very full data, for example, if I'm searching for, I don't know, businesses by geographical location. Absolutely. Then I could be combining <coughs> that set of information at the map side mm -hmm. 
Yep. I mean, yeah, you can, so you can, do, you can do all kinds of different things. So let's say, for example, you say, I want to take London, I want to break it up into 10 kilometer squares, and I want every single business which is in a 10 kilometer square, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to map the, the, the geography that describes that. So basically, um, top left, bottom right, in latitude and longitude, right? Which to describe your 10K um, thing. That would be your key, right? And then every single business in that 10K would be in there, and then that would go, um, and an index would be built. And then somebody would put, well, I am on Charing Cross Road, okay? So you would then say, well, Charing Cross Road it has this um, latitude and longitude, right? Which, so then you need to map produce job, which square, which 10K square is that in, okay? So you can, you can use simple geometry to work out that, and then you can return every single business in that 10 square K, 10K square, sorry. Mm -hmm. use division, it can mm -hmm. very much matter in what order the, the things arrive at the... Yes, so it does. So it matters. You have to pay attention to what you do. You have to understand. So this is why I spend so long explaining this, right? Because you have to understand what's actually happening. Because, for example, if you're doing a map produce, if you're doing a map produce and what you actually want is the average, what were my average sales? So let's say, for example, you, you are um, Tesco's, okay? And you have a file that's terabytes long, right? And it is data from every till, every item that went through every till from Tesco's in history, right? That is a big piece of data, all right? That's a, that's a big slap of data. But my produce, but a, a Hadoop cluster like this is exactly what you need for that kind of thing, all right? So what you're then doing is, let's say you want the average price that each till has earned, the average that each till has earned Tesco's forever, okay? What you've, you've got to be very careful with your reduce step because the average of a set of um, doubles in this case, right, is not the same as the average of averages, okay? So if your mapper is taking an average and then your reducer is taking the average of the average, the average of the average is not the same as the actual average. So you have to understand what Hadoop cluster is doing and you have to understand what the maths, the, the implications of what you're doing is, all right? So yes, it does matter, right? And you, you can make mistakes. And that's why, you know, MapReduce programmers, you know, Hadoop programmers need to understand what's happening. It's one, of the, it's one of the few areas these days in programming where you actually have to understand the architecture underneath. I mean, things like um, the <coughs> .NET runtime and the GVM kind of shield developers from having to know what the actual bit twiddling is underneath the hood. All right. I mean, prime, prime example of that is that you don't actually, with the GVM, you don't actually care what size integer is. What size an integer is depends on the architecture. Okay? Actually, you do. Uh, it's one of those uh, exotic facts about Java. The JVM is 32 bits wide, uh, and it does 64 bit addition in two, no, two non atomic operations. So if you don't wrap, wrap your 64 bit ads mm -hmm. uh, in a synchronized block, theoretically, you can get the wrong result. Right. Yeah. Theoretically, so, but in the manual, right, they say. <laughs> The benefit is you don't need to know. So, but I mean, because it's a prime, it's a prime interview yeah. question. No, no. Prime interview question is what's the size of an integer in the GVM? I'm, and the, I'm just saying that sort of architecture, they, they try hard yeah. to shield you from the architecture, but I know what you mean. But the, but there's a prime exactly. But there's a prime interview question that says what size is an integer on the GVM? And the, the answer to that question, the actual answer is what well, depends on the underlying architecture. You're kind of shielded a little bit. I understand that you're not entirely all right, but in this day and age. In general, you're shielded from the actual architecture. Not here, you're not, right? When you're writing map produce functions, you don't actually need to know what the bit twiddling at machine level is, but you need to understand what your cluster is doing. You need to understand what will happen when the map function runs. Otherwise, you get arithmetical problems around the, you get arithmetical errors around this idea that an average of averages is not the same as the overall average. Okay, although it may be close enough. I mean, if you are if you are averaging, you know, terabytes of data like that, it might be close enough. Um, the only way you tell is to take a sample and actually check. But to answer your question, and your question was, do you have to pay attention to what order things are done in? The answer to that question is absolutely, you do. Yeah, even if only to understand what the bug is. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Do 
doing circuit and you're, do, you're doing more of a select for the wear clause than a select for the heat clause. Yes. And you're saying that the, uh, the filtering can push out to the max. Yes. Then your reduce function is actually becoming an aggregate function <coughs> because you're not reducing anything. So. <coughs> and I was, I was looking at problems where I, there was no reduction and thinking, oh, is this, is this meant for me? But it's called reduce. And I'm actually just aggregating stuff from all these nodes. So there's, there's two things around now. Um, the, the, um, the, so the, the original question is, is basically, well, what happens if you say MapReduce is like select and group? What happens if you, if you want a SQL statement without a group? Okay, and the answer to that question is reducers are optional. Okay, pretty much like a group by clause is optional in a SQL statement, reducers are optional in MapReduce. Um, if you have the answer, if you only want a select, so... Um, give me all of the tills that Tesco has, but only in London stores, okay, and then I'll do something else with that at a later date, that's satisfied by a map function, in which case you just wouldn't specify. You, you would set the number of reducers, number of reducers equals zero, and it goes, okay, that's fine. And you just get the output of your mapping function, and you're done. And if I'm predominantly looking at those problems, am I looking at the wrong technology to solve it here because, it's, because the reducer is so... No, important. no, no, the reducer is not, no, the... the not so. Either. So yeah. I, I was wondering if you know, it's easy to pick up something and use it in a process. Yes. So the the answer so yes, the, the answer to that is it's just a way of um, parallelizing your, your task. And remember, right at the start, we said we're going to be constrained in two areas. <laughs> we'll be constrained by CPU and be constrained by memory. All right? You can be constrained only by CPU. It just takes me so damn long to do this calculation. Right? That what you want to be able to do is to spread that calculation out over a number of nodes. Well, that's fine. You're, all you need there is a mapper. You just need something to do that calculation. So let's say, for example, that I want to work out the probability of um, particular horses winning particular races on every race that's run on a given Saturday. All right? And so that is a problem. In, well, there's a number of ways to solve it, but imagine that we solve it with um, basically Bayesian inference, right? Where we're, we're basically um, taking each bit of evidence for every horse, we're taking every bit of evidence, right? And we're adjusting our probability on that horse winning based on the evidence we have, like who's the jockey, who's the trainer, what race course are they running at, all right? That's just the calculation we're doing, all right? We can put each of the, we can put each of the probabilities for each of the horses, right, to one race course, right, to each mapper. And then the output of the mapper is the answer. Okay, there's no further reduction. We don't want to know what, what an aggregate of the probabilities over all of the race courses are. We don't want to know the probability of some horse winning some race somewhere, right? We want to know which horse, which race, when, okay? And so the output from the mapper is the answer that you're looking for, in which case you don't need a reducer. But what we've done there is we've taken a very, very complicated calculation that would take hours to run on a single machine and then parallelized it across our map um, cluster, which could be hundreds of nodes long, right? And we get the answer in, in minutes, all right? So Hadoop has found itself very strongly attached to this idea of big data, okay? Um, and big data, even though there are five Vs of big data, right? Um, big data as a word has got itself attached to large volumes. The, the only V that anybody ever considers is, is the volume, right? And that's not, that isn't the case, right? So not every not every piece of big data is a big data problem because it's so large, all right? But not every problem you can solve with Hadoop has to do with big data either, right? You can have small amounts of data, relatively small amounts, a couple of gigabytes. Now, you don't need a compute cluster to deal with a couple of gigabytes in terms of the data size, right? That will quite happily fit on a SQL server, all right? But you might be doing a calculation with that data that is very computationally intensive so that you actually need a compute cluster to actually come up with the answer. Well, Hadoop is just as good at dealing with that than it is dealing with vast amounts of data. All right? So that's probably you know, one of the main principles to take away from this. Don't, because you'll find, and, and <laughs> to be honest, I'm just as much to blame as anybody else, we always attach Hadoop to big data problems, right? And that's not necessarily um, everything that Hadoop can do. OK, any more for any more? All right, so we've done our map producing here, right, and we've got our answers, right? So this is one half, right, of what happens. This is data in and processed, right? From the other half, 
queries can come in from this side. So we, we will um, present queries to our MapReduce um, cluster in exactly the, the same way. We will, we will put queries in here. MapReduce will run in exactly the same way as I have um, just um, described, and the answer will go back to, to the queries. And we'll look at ways that that happens as well. All right, so that is basically, unfortunately, <laughs> I didn't manage to get through the entire run through with a little bit of discussion in the middle, and so it's maybe a bit disjointed, but does everybody understand the workflow for MapReduce? Okay, one word of advice now, right? Do not go to the Wikipedia page and look up MapReduce algorithm, right? I understand MapReduce, I have read that page a number of times, and I do not understand what it says, right? As far as I'm aware, MapReduce does not work that way. Certainly, MapReduce, in Hadoop does not work that way, all right? So are there any online pages you would recommend? <laughs> um, actually, yes, yeah, so if, if for, particularly for Hadoop, right? Because the, the Wikipedia, I mean, I'm making a bit of a joke. It's the, the Wikipedia page um, is basically based on the, on the um, Google paper that was published, and it's very abstract, and it's very mathematical, and you look at that and you go, that is not how it works, right? And when I say that's not how it works, that's not how it works in, um, MapReduce on Hadoop. So for a start, one of the things it says is the input to a MapReduce must be a tuple, right? Well, that's nonsense for a start, right? You can take any data. We've already, down here, discussed that, right? It'll take anything, okay? And so the implementation is slightly different. So try not, if you're, if you're getting into Hadoop, try not to confuse yourself by going to the Wikipedia page like I did, because I totally confused myself. And then I had to go back to the Hadoop pages where I were before and read the, the explanation of MapReduce on the actual Hadoop pages, because that explains it very well. Okay, yes, sir? The central server where the data goes into and the queries go into. Yes, the name node. The name node. Yes. Is that uh, clustered in any way? So no, that's an awesome question, right? So I was hoping I was going to escape that one. All right, so the question there is, is the name node, actually, I'll paraphrase your question, right? The question is, and it's a very common one, is the, does the name node represent a single point of failure in your cluster? Right? And the answer to that question is yes, it does. Right? You lose the name node, your cluster dies. All right? There's two reasons for that. One, it's a very difficult problem to solve, although that's coming. There are people in the community working on clustered name nodes, and that's coming. All right? Secondly, the reason it's not done is it doesn't really matter. All right? And it doesn't really matter because you have, it's not shown on here, but you have a name node and job tracker, which does exactly as I've the name node does what I've explained. The job tracker does exactly what it says in the tin, right? Just keeps track of all of the jobs that are running. There's also another server there called the secondary name node, right? And what happens is that keeps a copy of everything that the name node knows, okay? But it's not um, active, active, and it's not active passive. It's kind of active, yeah, um, well, it's kind of active really passive, right? It's probably the best way to, uh, to describe that. And so, yeah. So what happens is if you lose your name node, what you have to do is you'll, you'll have to make sure it's up to date. You may have to cut copy across some um, files just to make sure everything is up to date. And then you bring your secondary name node up and then you just start again and everything is fine. And you, that may take you, how fast can you do that? That may take you 15 minutes, may take you 20 minutes. And when somebody says, the name node is a single point of failure and if you lose it, you might lose your cluster for 20 minutes. People go, <laughs> all right, don't really care. I mean, because we're, we're running big jobs, either computationally intensive or data intensive, right? These may take an hour to run, right? They may take a day to run, right? Depending on the size of your cluster and how much investment you want and how fast do you want the, the time. But, you know, uh, uh, a job that takes half a day to run is not, you know, uncommon, simply because that time scale is good enough. So why invest more money to, to get that information quicker? So in, in a world, where a job may take half a day to run, losing 20 minutes of time is neither here nor there. If it matters to you, there are solutions to that problem still. If your job dies, if the name node dies halfway through your day-long job, do you lose the whole job or is it something that carries over? Depends you, where it dies. Consider? Yeah, so the question there is, when it dies, how catastrophic is it? Um, so in theory, right, <laughs> my stock answer to that is it's catastrophic, start the job again, all right? In theory, if enough of the name nodes, enough of the data nodes have finished the mapping such that the mapping is complete. Because remember, there are three copies of it and it's, and it basically Hadoop works on a first to finish wins, 
kind of thing. So there'll be three copies of your job running, three copies of every map job running, and the first one to finish wins. All right. So just because not all of them finished, okay, there may be enough of the jobs finished that the actual mapping is complete, in which case you'd be able to move across the mapping output. Right? I would go, mm, I'd rather just start the job again. Right? I'm, I'm, not sure I would, I'm not sure I would trust that. Right? Um, I, would need, I would need so many tests right, on the mapping output that actually it would be faster probably just to start the job again. So I would this, need a compelling business case to put the effort in. Yeah. So the answer is always it's catastrophic start again, although technically it's not. <clears throat> okay, anybody else before we move off this awesome graphic? No? All right. So Hadoop comes in many flavors because it is um, it's an open source project. It is many and varied now. Lots of companies have taken Hadoop as a base and built other stuff on it, okay, and then shipped their flavor, okay? And basically, it, it pretty much, you know, you pay your money, you take your choice. What, what do you need? What's out there at the time? This is what, um, and this gets out of date really quickly because people are innovating in this field all the time, but this is what it looks like at the minute. There's a company called Cloudera. They do their own version. Who's, who's heard of Cloudera? Okay, a few people, that's good. There's Hortonworks. Hortonworks have a version for Linux and for um, Windows. As far as I'm aware, Hortonworks have the only version of um, Hadoop that is actually written for um, Windows Server. Okay, anybody heard of Hortonworks? Okay, good. There's HD Insights, right? Uh, sorry, it's HD Insight. I don't know why I keep putting an S on the end there. There's um, HD Insight, which is basically um, Hadoop on Azure, okay, by Microsoft. So you can actually, so under the hood, it's actually Hortonworks data platform for Microsoft Windows, right? And for some reason, not entirely sure why, not entirely sure what the difference is, okay? Can't, it's not immediately obvious, right? But and then on top of that, there is an HD Insight a, a, for um, Azure that comes on top of that. I think it's just to make it easier for people, you know, you can go into the Azure marketplace and go, I want one of them. I want a cluster, ping, give me one, make it so. So that is particularly, this is Linux or Microsoft Server this is particularly Azure, okay? So that's the difference there. Anybody heard HD Insight? Anybody actually used it? Anybody got the preview? Because you can sign up now if you've got an Azure account, you can sign up to get the preview. Have you used it? Yep. You can actually install it on your machine, and that's what I did, and right up until about 48 hours ago, all of the demos that I'm gonna run through later on were all on HD Insight, which has been really cool. And then for no apparent reason, it stopped working. So they're now going to be in Hortonworks. But I will show you it broken. In fact, it's only, it's only slightly broken because bizarrely, the underlying Hadoop is still there, okay? But I've lost connectivity to the dashboard. So I can't actually upload any files or do any jobs through the dashboard. I can drop down at the command line and do it, right? But for some reason, the dashboard has stopped working, right? Now, for a, for a session like this, nobody wants to see me type in a command line, right? Trust me, you do not want to see me do that. So we're just going to move over and use Hortonworks, okay? But that's HD Insight. And then there's the vanilla. If you're a really hardcore geeky guy, right? Or girl, when I say guy, I mean collectively. I don't necessarily just mean male people. Um, you can get a Linux machine. You can go to the Apache website. You can download that stuff. You can compile it all. You can have this and that, and you can build all that stuff yourself. All right. Some people like doing that. Right. Some people like to build their own cars. Right. I just like to go to Mercedes and say I'll have that one, thanks. Right. But if you're the kind of guy who likes to build their own car, then there's always the vanilla projects at Apache. They're all, they all live under the sort of uh, Apache umbrella. All right, so this is what's in the Cloud Data one. As I say, they're all, <coughs> they're, all pretty, um, they're all pretty similar. They're all based on Hadoop, but other companies have actually packaged other things with them. So here, we've got this metadata stuff. I'm not gonna say anything about it just now because it's easier to describe it later on when I actually show you, right? But just take for granted at the minute there's a thing called metadata, which does exactly what it says in the tin. It describes your data, all right? We've got the storage here, we've got resource management, and we'll talk a bit about that. Up here on the engines, you've got machine learning from Mahout. You've got um, Cloudera Search, which is obviously, you know, it's their own product, that's why they um, bundle it here. 
you've got um, SQL through Impala, right? So Impala is one way of doing it. Hive is another way of doing it. They've gone the Impala route, so they've wrapped that. And then there's obviously MapReduce. There has to be MapReduce in there, and there's Hive and Pig and everything like that as well. Um, so you take a look at that, and if that more closely matches the infrastructure that you need it to run on, plus the kind of jobs that you're going to be doing with it, then this is the, this is the installation you'd go for. Over here, this is, um, this is the Hortonworks one. Um, Hortonworks has, um, all has a dupe pig. Hi, this is all the, the base stuff. Um, HCAT is the thing that does your um, the metadata. Right, we'll talk about that later. There's, um, these are just awesome names, right? Scoop and Flume are basically ways of getting data into your um, Hadoop cluster, all right? We can, we'll do it the old-fashioned way when I'm demoing it. We'll just basically go upload file, okay? But there are other ways to do it. Um, scoop will allow you to scoop out data from your SQL Server database and put it into, um, put it into Hadoop. So if you've already got data in a SQL Server database and you want it on the cluster, then scoop is the way to do that. Um, Flume is a way to take streaming data. So clickstream data, if you want to analyze who's coming to your website and all the rest of that kind of stuff, or um, if you want to analyze Twitter feeds and stuff like that, so, or, or any data that streams, um, movie or audio or anything like that, then Flume is the way to go. Again, they've got Mahout. Mahout is the machine learning um, engine. Um, it's got Zookeeper as well that comes with that. Zookeeper, <laughs> Zookeeper, you see what I mean about this sort of common theme, all right? So Zookeeper, we'll talk about that later on. Um, so that is the Hortonworks version, again, it's fairly similar to Cloudera, but you can see where, where different vendors have made different choices about what to bundle. This is um, what the dashboard looks like for HD Insight when it's working. Um, you can see it does scoop down here. Um, it will do streaming. Uh, we'll talk a bit about that later on as well. Um, yeah, it's got pig and hive and all that kind of stuff under the hood. So it's basically like the Hortonworks. So basically what I said there before, the slide previous to this where I showed you the Hortonworks stuff, HD Insight has the same thing. It's just got the Microsoft front end. This really irritates me. Okay, I don't know why it irritates me. I think it irritates me because intuitively I feel this is marketing over engineering. I, I have this idea in my head that there was a battle in Microsoft between engineering and marketing. This could be a complete lie. It's just in my head. I see this battle between engineering and marketing and marketing won and engineering lost and that always upsets me. The UI for this is all tile-based, right? Because you know some marketeer somewhere said we need the Metro theme, right? There is a perfectly good UI that both the Cloudera and Hortonworks use, right? It's an open source UI for Hortonworks. It's called Hue, as in Hue the color, H-U-E. Um, and it stands for Hortonworks User Experience. No, it doesn't. It stands for Hadoop User Experience, okay? That's there, that's done. People are working on that. That, that is a thing that it exists and everybody else uses. And Microsoft went, yeah, not us. We're, we're going to go with this tiled thing because it looks like the Metro theme, right? Now, that could be a whole load of rubbish. There could be a, an awesome engineering reason why it looks like that and why they didn't use Hue, right? But in my head, right, it was marketing and engineering. And engineering said, no, look, we don't need to write this. It exists already. Marketing said, no, we want tiles and we want green tiles. <clears throat> so that's why it looks like that. It's a bit irritating. Another reason it irritates me, actually, is because you lose this whole idea of the framework being platform agnostic. Right now with the other two vendors, they both use Hue. Now Hue is in a different color scheme on both the vendors, who cares, right? But it does the same thing, right? So you can move from a Cloudera platform on Linux, okay, to a Hortonworks platform on um, Microsoft technology and your users wouldn't notice the difference right? because it both uses Hue, okay? It would look exactly the same and they are, the, the way they perform their tasks would be exactly the same, all right? But you can't go from Cloudera to Hortonworks to HD Insight, right? It looks completely different, all right? And that's annoying. It messes with my OCD. <laughs> all right, so let's have a look at the Hadoop environment then. So, as I said, it, it all comes under the Hadoop project. If you go to the Apache website and you look at the Hadoop project, all of this stuff is, is under there and it's all available for you to download. You can have a look at the source code if you really want to scare yourself, all right? And you can contribute and, you know, you can, you can help bring the community forward. So there is Hadoop Common. There is a common infrastructure, a common framework layer. And what happens in there is all of the utilities, the support, all of the other Hadoop modules, right, not unsurprisingly, are in Hadoop Common, okay? 
There's HDFS, or the Hadoop Distributed File System. That's the thing that does, that sol solves your data partitioning problem. Remember right at the start, we talked about the fact that you have this problem. Well, the HDFS solves that problem for you. There's Yarn. Now, it says there's Yarn. If you look at the website, it says it's Yarn, but Yarn is a 2.0 thing. Um, it, is a, it is a project that's coming in 2.0. At the minute, we're at 1.3, and 2.0 is in beta, all right? But it's coming real soon. And Yarn is going, is, um, uh, what does the N stand for again? It's um, yet another resource, and I can't remember what the N stands for. I, I have manager stuck in my head, but manager doesn't start with an N, and now I can't find the real word, but it's a word that means the same thing as manager, but starts Numpty. with an N. Pardon? Numpty. Numpty, yes. <laughs> Bo -bom. Okay, so that's going to schedule your job and helps you with um, resource management, just like I said, unfortunately. I can't remember where the N is. And then, of course, there's MapReduce, okay, which in 2.0 is a yarn-based system for parallel processing. In 1.3, it's not yarn-based, but it's still... It's still a framework for parallel processing. And all that stuff is wrapped up in the common. There are other projects which you can mix and match. As I said right at the start, I'm going to run through them all. If you've installed them all, you're probably doing something wrong in your design. Okay, But you need to know that, that these things exist. So there's Ambari. I'm not going to read all of this text out. It's here on the slides because you can download the slides and it will become a resource for you. I don't intend to stand here and read all this stuff out. So don't worry that it's flashing past really fast, right? It's there for your information after the session, really. So there's Ambari, and what Ambari is going to do is to help you with your in installation, really. I mean, if you need to install a 99 or a 1,000 node cluster, okay, you do not want to have to go to every single machine with a, with a, a CD and go, install Hadoop. What's the IP address with that? And then go to the name node and say, please pay attention to this, to the data node on this, right? Do you want to use something which will distribute all that for you? And Ambari is a piece of software which will help you um, install your cluster in the first place, but will also help you monitor it, okay? So like I said before, Hadoop as an infrastructure will handle the fact that, um, it will handle the fact that data nodes die by re-replicating the data. But that's all it's going to do. Right? It isn't going to tell you <laughs> that it's broken, and it's certainly not going to fix it for you. All right? So you still need some kind of notification mechanism that, that uh, you've got a hard disk failure and somebody needs to go fix it. Right? So Ambari will help you do all of those kind of monitoring tasks as well. Av Avro gives you serialization. So serialization, a data serialization is important if you want to write software against a cluster. So at the minute, we, up until now, we've been talking about um, we're going to be using the cluster and we're going to go into the name node either through the command line or through the Hue um, user interface and we're going to actually run jobs and things like that. Right? But what happens if I actually want to write software, if I want to write a service against um, the Hadoop cluster? I need to be able to do that. Well, Avro gives you um, a serialization mechanism that will allow you to pass data backwards and forwards between your software and the Hadoop cluster. Cassandra is a scalable multi-master database with no single point of failure, right? Cassandra is a great database for this kind of thing, right? Because it's fully distributed, all right? There's, it's masterless, right? Um, um, and there's lots of other good things about it that we'll talk about later. Chukwa, that's uh, uh, a brilliant name, all right? But um, it's data collection, uh, more data collection stuff, and we'll talk about that later as well. Okay, there's HBase. HBase is another kind of database, right? It's... Um, Similar to Cassandra, um, and as much as it's a database for Hadoop, it just does things slightly differently. It has, um, it supports structured data, all right? We talked about the different kinds of data before. This is structured data. Okay, there is Hive. Hive um, basically gives you a data warehouse stroke SQL abstraction on top of um, Hadoop. So what happens is, up until now, we've seen, we've seen expressing MapReduce algorithms in Java and actually going, here's our mapper, here's our reducer. Optionally, here's our combiner. Okay? Well, Hive will give you a SQL-like abstraction over the top of um, Hadoop, which means that you can actually write in um, what's called um, HiveQL, so a, a SQL-like language, and then the compiler for that will actually build a series of MapReduce jobs for you based on that. So it means that you don't have to worry so much about what's the mapper doing, what's the reducer doing, how am I going to do this, the kind of problems that we spoke about earlier, all of those kind of disappear because you will just write your query in um, SQL to all intents and purposes, and then the compiler for that will 
um, do all the map reduce function creation for you. Okay, so it's an abstraction over there. But as you indicated, it still doesn't fully protect you. It doesn't fully protect you because then it just leads to more ways of shooting in the foot, like group star, group by star, for example, giving you a, a global, um, giving you a, a global key will kill your register. Although, so I've never actually tried it. <laughs> basically because I don't want to mess things up, but I think it might actually warn you if you do dumb stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mahout is um, scalable machine learning. Um, people who are interested in doing clustering um, and classification, that kind of thing. So classification is things like um, spam filtering, for example. Yes, that one's spam, that one's ham. That one goes in the bin, that one goes to your email. That's classification, right? So you can do machine scalable machine learning because again, um, there is machine learning algorithms which are then scaled out across your MapReduce cluster. There's pig. This is the other language I was talking about. It does exactly the same thing as Hive does, except not for the SQL language. It's a, it's a new language called pig Latin. But again, it provides you with an abstraction over MapReduce. You write in this pig Latin language, and then Hadoop itself, the compiler for pig, will give you, um, will give you MapReduce functions. Zookeeper, as I said, um, coordination system for distributed applications. When you've got all of these things using data, moving stuff around, you need something to actually um, coordinate that. So we're just going to quickly um, go through some of these just so you um, basically you know in the slides where to look more than anything else. Okay, so let's have a look at um, these projects in different areas. So there's things which manage data, there are things which act on the data, and there's things that do support and plumbing. So the, the products are basically um, broken down into those three areas, all right? So let's have a look at the data then. So we've got Avro, uh, we've got Cassandra, and we've got HBase, um, and we've got this thing called Hive. Um, so Avro, it gives us rich structures, okay, for serialization, all right? Compact and fast binary data form, because if we're moving large amounts of data about, right, we want to be able to do that in binary form, we want to be able to do it quickly, okay? Allows us to store persistent data, allows us to do remote procedure calls, all right? It's really simple to integrate with dynamic languages. So if you're using something like Python to um, communicate with, all right, it's perfect for that kind of thing. Um, you don't actually need to do the code generation, but if you do, it's an optimal, optim sorry, it's an optional optimization um, for statically typed languages like Java and things like that. So you have the option to do it if you want, but it's, it's optional, okay? Um, Cassandra, again, as I say, is a massively scalable open source um, database, and that's why um, it's it's important for Hadoop if you're using it um, to actually deal with with big data problems. And not everybody is, as we said before. Okay, um, you can actually um, you can actually um, what's the word I'm looking for? Distribute this across data centers in, in the cloud. So it's not just distributable across machines in a data center. You can actually have it across data centers as well. Okay. What it's going to do is it's going to deliver continuous availability, right? So if you require access to your data all the time, right, and guaranteed, right, then Cassandra is the way you want to go. It's linearly scalable, and I'll um, show you a graphic about that in a second. Um, works on commodity servers, which makes it cheap, right? Okay, so you just need you just need more more tin, basically, and it's cheap tin. It's not the kind of high-end servers you would need to have on a SQL Server farm, for example, right? So you can have, you can build a Cassandra farm relatively cheaply. There is no single point of failure with um, Cassandra cluster because all of the data is everywhere. Um, yeah, that's fine. So it's masterless architecture. All nodes are the same. There's automatic data distribution across all of the nodes that participate in what they call a Cassandra ring. All right, And that happens automatically for you. You get that behavior out of the box. Okay, And you can do customizable replication. Just before you said that, I'm just going to ask, is this something from the data manager? Yes. Yes, but you would use the easiest thing to do is to use Ambari to actually install that. So Cassandra would go, Cassandra would go on your on your data nodes, or whichever way you want to do it, right? And it's and and it scales linearly, right? And I mean, and it really it it really does um, scale in this way, you know. So as you double the number of nodes, you double the number of transactions, okay? And so you can scale up and scale back down again really quickly um, with Cassandra. You don't get that kind of um, diminishing returns from your scaling, right? It is it is linear. So if your Cassandra database is too slow, just do a binary partition and and make it twice the size, um, and that problem will go away. And then of course problems in 
speed and things like that then become um, a function of your checkbook. You know, if, if you want it to go faster, it costs more money. If you've got more money, great. If you don't have more money, then you'll have to save up, right? But it's, it's, it's an easy fix. So HBase is a distributed column orientated uh, store. It's very much like Google's big table, right? It's very much modeled on that. Does everybody know what big table is from Google? Anyway, it's modeled on that. Built on top of Hadoop, as all of these things are, um, for MapReduce and distributed file system implementation, right? So it's one of the things we, it's all right, it's all very well for us to say, well, what happens is, you know, um, your data is, is split down into 64 megabyte splits and this happens and that happens, but something has to track where it went and how many splits there are and, and getting it all back together again. And because when you look at that, you're actually given an abstraction over that. You look at the front end, and we'll look at that shortly, you look at the front end and you see the file, all right? But it doesn't actually physically exist like that, all right? This is just, in much the same way as when you look at the Explorer on your hard drive, um, it shows you here is the file, but actually we know it's, um, it's split across the hard drive in lots of little blocks, right? This is exactly the same thing except for a distributed file system. Hive is a thing that I was talking about earlier. It gives you a data warehouse abstraction, um, so it facilitates um, easy data summarization, you know, you know um, averages and sums, and the kind of things that, that you do run of the mill on um, SQL Server. Um, really good at analysis of large data sets and that kind of thing as well, all right? Stored in a Hadoop compatible file system. So things that act on our data then, all right? So we've got Pig and we've got Mahout. Right? We're not going to demonstrate Mahout today because um, you need to have quite an understanding of machine learning, and I don't want this to turn into a data science machine learning session. Right? And frankly, right before lunch, neither do you guys. Okay? But we just want to have an, an oversight. I just want to actually point it out, much like the rest of the stuff I'm going through here. I don't really necessarily want to talk in depth about it, so we're just flashing through the slides. I just want you to know something exists for doing that, something exists for doing that. I'll, I'll bear that in mind. You know, I, I can remember... I don't remember exactly, Gary didn't go into any detail, but he did tell me there was a SQL abstraction over Hadoop and I want to use SQL because I'm comfortable in that language. I'll go find out what that was kind of thing. So if you need to do machine learning, Mahout is the way to go. All right, that's all I'm going to say about that. All right, so PIG, um, again, it's a platform for an anal analyzing large data sets, right? I don't know why they bother to say that on the project page, right? Everything that runs on Hadoop is, right? Um, so it consists of a high level language to express programs. All right, as I said before, some guy somewhere decided there weren't enough languages in the world and we needed another abstraction over Hadoop, so he invented Pig um, Latin. And there's also an infrastructure to execute those programs. What happens, as I said, much like, the, uh, much like Hive with um, Hive SQL, you write in this language, there's a compiler that will break that down into one or more MapReduce sets of functions for you and then split that out over your, over your um, cluster you then don't have to worry about what the map or what the producer does and all the rest of it. You just have to actually define your algorithm in this much easier to define language um, called pig. We'll have a look at some pig Latin script and we'll compare the size of the pig Latin script to the size of the Java at the start, right? And then you'll see why pig is a very popular language to write and Hadoop against. So ease of programming is one of its strengths, right? Much, much easier than Java and much less verbose, right? You get the automatic optimizations, there's a compiler, right? So the compiler understands much more so than I certainly want to ever understand about how, um, what optimizations will work best for mappers and reducers and, and things like that, right? The compiler will do it. In much the same way as when you write C-sharp or Java code, the compiler will do optimizations that you just don't want to have to worry about, all right? So you can get that advantage here as well, all right? And it's very extensible, all right? There is a, quite a lot of built-in functionality inside um, PIG. It'll do things like max and min and standard deviation and all of that kind of stuff. But if there is a function that is missing that you require, you can write that function in Java and update it as a user-defined function just with a jar. So you basically just upload a jar file and then your function then becomes part of your own in-house DSL for, for PIG. So it's really easy to, to make extensible. And that makes it extremely powerful. Mahout, as I said, is in your machine learning library, scalable to reasonably large data sets, right? <coughs> Simply because uh, that, that word obviously catches you because you know, Hadoop says before, well, it doesn't matter. You just need more nodes, right? Well, machine learning is slightly different, all right? Because they're using machine learning algorithms, um, not all machine learning stuff is parallelizable, all right? And so we can only go to reasonably large data sets, right? 
to date, there is no definition for reasonably large. All right, there you go. The algorithms that supports are for clustering. That is where you say, here's a whole pile of data, Mahout. I do not know anything about it. I'm trying to get an in, right? So it's basically like you can imagine that you're at Bletchley Park in 1945 and you're, you're presented with a code, right? You don't know anything about it. You're just, trying to, you're just trying to get into it in some way. Well, if you've got a large data set, terabytes in size, and you don't know how to actually get into it, you can't find out what data actually holds. Um, you can actually use clustering and you can throw this at a Mahout cluster and say, I don't know anything about this data, but cluster the like data together, right? And then maybe that'll help me. And um, Mahout will say, well, I don't know anything about the data either, but these things are all the same, right? And those things are all the same as each other, but are different from these things, right? And then that might actually give you a little, a little um, edge into your data. And then, as I said before, this classification. Classification is the one where it says, um, here is some training data, this is spam, please identify everything else I look at as being spam. All right, so if those are the kind of jobs that you're doing, then the hoot is the one that you're looking for. For the support and plumbing, we've got Ambari, as we said before, this is the way we want to go. There's Chukwa and there's uh, Zookeeper. So Ambari will um, help you with your provisioning, which is what you want. Nobody wants to do a thousand node cluster node at a time, right? If you ever do that, you don't want to do it twice, okay? You also need something to manage. As I said before, the underlying framework will help you if you've got hard drive failures or rack failures or stuff like that, but it won't tell you. It will just move the data around for you, all right? You need something that will actually manage that and alert you in these things, and Ambari will do that. Also, the monitoring. It does that via a, a web UI, all right? It's, it's quite nice to look at. Or RESTful UIs, uh, sorry, RESTful APIs if you want you know, to hook up email class uh, notifications or if you just want to do specific things when specific things happen, you can just actually use the, the APIs and have that happen all automatically. So if you've got a monitoring software that you're using anyway in your environment, you've got a way to hook it in? Um, yes, if you've got a way to extend um, your stuff um, and get into it, then absolutely you can use the APIs within, within Ambari. Yeah. So Chukwa, I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that right, to be honest. Um, there's no pronunciation guide on their project page, so we just have to assume that I am. But that's, um, that gives you large-scale and reliable log collection. Okay, So if you're logging out stuff from your mappers or you're doing um, logging other things, right, but you're doing it in a, on a massive scale across your cluster, then you need something to gather those log files together. And Chuck was a thing for doing that. And then we're Zookeeper again. Um, I don't, I don't intend to read all this out. Um, it's basically high performance coordination system. All right, so if you're using distributed applications, as I've said, if you want a bit more information, you can download this slide deck afterwards and go into this in more detail. Um, but basically you can use it um, off the shelf to do um, consensus and group management and that kind of thing. But actually you can use it as, also use it as a base to build your own um, specific um, requirements for um, group management and that kind of thing. All right, so. Zookeeper is the, is the boss that keeps everything ticking over nicely. Okay, I was going to demonstrate that. Uh, I'm not because um, I can't get it. I can demonstrate it. No, I can't even demonstrate it not working because um, we don't have a good internet connection. So there are two ways I would recommend getting into Hadoop. If you've, after this session, if you think, yeah, it's, it's something I want to find out more about. The two easiest ways to get into it are, one, the HD Insights. Insight, I don't know why I keep calling it Insight. The HD Insight developer preview, although I said it's for Azure and it is, right, there is a developer preview which <laughs> will load on your machine, right? There are some people with Win8 machines who have problems installing this, right? You can look up the internet, you can see all of these people having all of these problems, right? There's not many solutions. I have one of the problems for which there isn't a solution at the minute. Um, However, having said that, it worked right up until 40 hours ago, right? And has been on my machine for weeks. Um, there, there is this tile that shows you the job count and it was in the, in the high three figures, right? So I'd run many jobs on it um, and then all of a sudden it stopped working. But the easiest way to install that if it works is just to launch the um, web platform installer, um, use the search, search for HD Insight um, and install it. It will install two things. It will install the HD Insight developer preview and it will also install the Hortonworks data platform because I said that HD Insight is basically just an abstraction over the Hortonworks data platform for Windows, okay? That will install that on your local machine, okay? And it will work and everything will be lovely. 
if it works, okay? And the other way to do it, the other easy way to get involved is to get one of the others, Cloudera or Hortonworks, okay? And both of them have what's called a sandbox installation. So vanilla Hadoop can be installed in a range of ways, okay? One of them is proper cluster. I have a proper cluster, let's do real work, okay? The other one is I want to pretend um, to be a cluster for development purposes, okay? And so it will, on one machine, it will install, and by using ports, it will pretend to be a number of machines, okay? And then the third way is I want it in standalone mode, right? I want the name node, the job tracker, the, the thing that runs the mapper and the juicer all to be on one machine, okay? So you can install it in those three ways, okay? The sandbox from both Cloudera and from Hortonworks, okay, is a virtual machine. Um, I'm not entirely sure about Cloudera, but with Hortonworks, you can um, get virtual machines for both um, VirtualBox and for Hyper-V, okay? And that's what I'm using on this machine. I'm using the Hyper-V um, Hortonworks sandbox, okay? And the sandbox comes, it's a pre-installed virtual machine in standalone mode, okay? All ready for you to go. So you just have to launch it and, and away you go, all right? So that's basically the three ways of doing the installation. Although if you want to do a proper cluster, then for the love of God, use Ambari and provision your cluster that way, okay? Right, any questions about that? As I say, I was going to demonstrate install, but nobody wants to watch, nobody wants to watch uh, megabytes of information come down over the Wi-Fi. And as I said, anybody here, has anybody he not used the web platform installer from Microsoft before to install something? Right, so you've seen it all before. Anyway, it's, it's, just, another, it's just another application that comes via the um, web platform installer, okay? From the uh, talk about the infrastructure at the beginning, I yes. seem to assume that SANS are out of the question as far as tools are concerned. Um, that's a good question. So the question there is, can you use SANS with Hadoop? And the answer to that question is, I don't know. That's a hardware, that's a hardware problem. Um, what? What it will do is it will use the disks on the data nodes. If those disks on the data nodes are backed by a SAN, I don't see why it wouldn't use that. It must be able to do that, he says, thinking quickly on his feet, because if you can use it in the cloud, I'll guarantee you the Azure cloud does not consist of <laughs> servers with just their hard drives in them, right? I'm gonna be pretty certain that Azure, for example, the virtual machines that they've got there are sandbacked. Therefore, Hadoop must work under those circumstances because you can get Hadoop on the cloud platform. So that's about 60%. I'd go check, right? But I would, from, from how I know people are using it, I can only assume that it does because I can't imagine. I can't imagine that Azure, for example, spins up virtual machines and doesn't have that sandbagged, right? I, it has yeah. to. Yeah, anybody else? No, all right, so let's make Hadoop do stuff, right? What's it, what's it going to look like? Um, so what we're gonna do is, quickly get rid of that. Um, I do not want that, thank you very much. <coughs> do you know what? I'm just gonna get rid of those slides because we're kind of finished now, right? And that's just gonna annoy me. Give me this back. Okay, so if we go here. Why is it done now? Is it because it's too hot, I wonder? Ah. Did it just take the huff because I <laughs> stopped my slides? No, it didn't change. <laughs> yeah, stop. Stop talking, Gary. Let's put the slides back on again then and see if it comes back. Can't believe it's anything to do with that. No, it's in there. Let's, all right, let's, um, Let's take that out and let's take it back in again because everybody knows that um, turning it on and turning it back off again 
works. But oh, hey, you see? <laughs> it is, in fact, a machine. Unbelievable. OK. So um, here is our JavaScript. And this is so JavaScript is not. This is Java, all right? And um, this is going to do our word count, but we're going to do it in native, um, native Java with native MapReduce. So let's start, actually, everything we're going to need. So here is an ant build script. All right, all it really says is, all we're really interested in is in this, right? We need a jar. That's how we're going to, to upload our uh, MapReduce functions to Hadoop. We need a jar, so that's what we need to build. Um, we also need to um, add to the class path the actual Hadoop core jar, which gives us all of the nice classes um, that we're going to need to define our jobs and all the rest of it, and I'll show you those in ports in a minute. Um, and the rest of it just tidies stuff up and, and creates a jar. So that's what the build script does, really, really simple. Basically, it just says, I want a jar, thank you very much. And by the way, you need to add this to your class path. Um, we need three things. First of all, we need a mapper. So this is what our mapper does. I don't intend to walk through the code because it isn't that important. This is the bit here that actually does the work. Um, that does the counting of the words. Here is the imports that I was talking about before. These are the imports that we need the class that we need the uh, Hadoop core jar for. Okay, um, so that is the that is the action code there that does the same mapping. It does exactly the same mapping as we looked at on the C sharp code. Okay, now we also need a reducer. Here is our reducer. Again, here is the action part there. All right. It does exactly what the same as the C sharp stuff does. It basically just groups all of those things together. So it does exactly the same thing. All right. Does anybody have any questions about the code? I don't want to use a complicated example, right? It's very simple mapper and reducer. OK. So having done that, what we want to do here now is open this up, get a new command window. We want to run ant, and hopefully we get a nice build. There we go. Build was successful. So we've got our jar file. All right, so having our jar file now, what we want to do is to open a browser. And I've got uh, my Hadoop Sandbox here, Hadoop Sandbox 1.3 running in Hyper-V. All right, so that's the, that's the flavor I've gone for. There are many other flavors. Um, knock yourself out, basically. Down here is here's where it's running here. And you can see it's running on 192.168.200. OK, um, I think it comes out at um, 192.168.56.100 by default. If that works for you, then just keep the default. If it doesn't, you can go in and you can set a static IP address or set a dynamic IP address if you actually want it on your network or whatever. You know, you can configure it however you want once it's up and running. But there it is. OK, so now we have done that, we actually want this to work. So what I have to do is, we have to, we said we have to upload a file. Remember that graphic? The first thing we do is we, we upload a file. So what I want to do here under um, SA 2013, I want to create a new folder. And we'll call this hello. And before we do that, we'll go back in here because I missed a step, didn't I? Um, I said we need three things. And then I told you what two things were. And then you let me move on. And nobody said, well, what's the third thing, Gary? So I'm going to blame you for that. What we actually need here is a, is a word count Java file, which is actually the thing that's going to kick it all off. Right? It's going to actually do the work. At the minute, we've described a map function, and we've described a reduce function. Okay? But we haven't actually told it to do anything with those functions. This is the thing that actually says what to do. So down here, first of all, first thing it's going to do here is it says, hey, you better tidy up the output. And the reason you have to do that is if you try to output, if your reducer outputs to a path that already exists, it will fail with a warning because it just assumes you want that data, right? So it won't overwrite that data. So if your output path um, exists already, it's going to bitch about it, all right? So here, we're, going to do, we're just going to go and tidy that up, all right, and remove that path. And then what we're going to do in the job configuration here, this is the business end, what we need to do is we need to start a new job configuration, pointing it to the Java class all right, that's actually starting everything off, OK? Then what we're going to do is we're going to set the output key and the output value. So what we're doing is we're setting a data type, 
Remember I said that um, outputs have to be in a key value, in a tuple and a key value pair, all right? Because Java is a statically typed language, it wants to know what those um, types are going to be. So here we've said the output is going to be a string for the key, i.e. the word, and it's going to be an int, an int writable, but let, ignore that for a second. It's going to be an int in the output for the actual value. So we're going to have a word and a value. If we try to put something out which is not a string and an int, we're going to get an error. All right. So there we get some protection from the statically typed language. It doesn't get all the way to our um, doesn't get all the way to our cluster and fail before we find out. All right. Then we are set the mapper class, and here I've imaginatively called it map. Um, our combiner class, and this answers the question that Jarman had before. Um, is the combiner just going to be the reducer for most things? And, and, it, and it is, and so we just set it to reduce. Then we set a reduce class. We say what our input is going to be and what our output format is going to be. All right. And